What's up, guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm trying something new today. I've got this set up with an overhead camera, which is just my phone. And I thought I would jump on here and try a slow crochet video. Ever since I've started crocheting, it's been really great for my mind because it helps my mind keep busy while it's also working through questions or problems or just things. And I can think about a couple of things at the same time while I'm being productive, which is really great because I used to just play Animal Crossing <laughs> and think through problems. And this is way more productive than Animal Crossing. So what I'm working on right now is a cardigan for my niece's birthday and she's turning eight. It's a very cute age. And I'm working with the Loops and Threads Facets yarn, which is a glossy type of yarn. And I don't know what this is called, but I know there's a name for it. It's this type of yarn that is not, that sort of looks like cotton and it's not made of where it's like a bunch of smaller threads twisted together. My vocabulary is really lacking in this space is how you can tell I'm a novice crocheter. But it's sort of this fluffy yarn. It sort of looks like cotton. It's incredibly soft. It's 100% acrylic, and this is the colorway cotton candy. I went to Michael's a few days ago, and I've always walked by the fastest display. I love the variegated yarn that they have. I think it's so beautiful. The color combinations are so beautiful, but I was never super confident about what I would do with this. And I had read things about how this kind of yarn can break if you pull too hard in it. I was just nervous. But a few days ago, I got really brave and I bought a few skeins of this and I bought a few skeins of the sea glass colorway, which is a beautiful dark blue and dark green colorway. And I made my nephew a pullover using that. And I'm using this pastel one to make my niece a cardigan. So this is where we're at. We're, we've done the body. So here is the body of the cardigan. And it's done in a top-down round yoke style. And this is, you know, for every, every time I learn a new construction technique, I feel like I need to do it four or five times until I feel like comfortable and like more confident doing it. So this is probably the fourth <laughs> round yoke top-down cardigan I've made. And when I really like doing something, I'll do it obsessively for days at a time. So here's one that I'm also working on in a different weight yarn. Obviously, it's a little bit chunkier. This is a four yarn, and this is also an acrylic. I've made myself a top-down cardigan using um, this wool that I bought in England from West Yorkshire Spinners that I really, really liked. Um, and this is, this is acrylic and this is for kids. So it's like way softer. You can see the stitch definition is really nice. It's a little bit glossy. I'm just finishing up on the left sleeve here. And I thought I would do a right sleeve on camera. <laughs> just hard. To, I feel like now I'm concentrating on three things at one time, but I think I can do it. So yeah. This is what we're using. I'm using a tulip, a Timo hook. And I think, I don't, I think a Timo is just the line where they have the silicone slash rubber soft handles. I really like tulip hooks. And I didn't realize that until I bought a bunch of them. The, I bought a gold set from Amazon Japan, which is actually just sold through regular Amazon. I bought it through American Amazon and it shipped through Amazon Japan and it came in a whole kit. It was very affordable. I think I got 13 hooks and like scissors and yarn, like darning needles for, I don't know, like $40, 13 hooks for $40, which is really good. They came from Japan. This is a four millimeter. I've been using this for ribs, so I might use that in a moment. But for the body, which is just done in double crochet all around, the yoke is done where uh, it's in a double crochet with an increase every one twelfth of the length. And the body is just, you know, double crochet consistently all the way around. The sleeves, I started the sleeves by decreasing four times and then 
decreasing twice, then decreasing twice, and then decreasing every other row until I got to the circumference that I want, which I think this is about right. I might do one more row. I don't tend to put very long sleeves on my garments. I personally, I always pull my sleeves up. I always have, but I personally prefer it when sleeves aren't hanging over my hands just for practical purposes. So I've been making a lot of sweaters with shorter sleeves. Also, I've heard this term called sleeve island in crochet where you're like stuck on sleeve island and you can't get off. I think it's really funny, but I don't like being on sleeve island very much. So I think we'll do one more row here and then we'll do a little rip to finish it off. I've been watching a lot of crochet videos, which I think, you know, not surprised because I learned to crochet from watching YouTube. Um, but I like a lot of these long form crochet with me videos. I've been making a lot of shorts lately, which I really enjoy doing because it's very gratifying to, you know, make something and publish it sort of like the same way that after you crochet a sweater, you crochet it and then it's practical and it's out there and you can put it on or someone you give it to can put it on. It just feels like you've made something. Making shorts feels like that on like a, min, like a minuscule scale. But I also want to try making longer form crochet content because I really like watching it too. I've really enjoyed learning round yoke top down sweater construction because for me, I find that this construction is the easiest construction to get a decent fit. Um, the first cardigan or sweater I made was done in panels and it was also double crochet. I made the front panel, back panel sleeves, and then I sewed them all together. It was fine. I personally don't prefer sewing. I don't mind it, but I don't prefer it. The second style of sweater I learned how to make was um, crocheting across. So chaining the length of the body from shoulder to hem and then crocheting across. That style really does not suit me. I think it looks really, really good actually, but it doesn't suit my body type. So I've made all these sweaters that I thought were really cute, but then look terrible when I put them on. I also learned square yoke, which is fine. But again, I have issues with the way it fits me personally. I'm, my, I really like my goal with making wearables is so I can make lots of sweaters for myself. And what I have found is that, you know, I've sort of just been through all the basic construction techniques that I found on YouTube and then in crochet books and things like that. And I found that I really enjoy fully, I, I don't know if this is called fully fashioned, but when you don't have to sew things together, I enjoy this style of construction. And I found that the round yoke sweaters fit me better. They just look better. They fall better. They drape better on me. And so now I'm just making them like with abandon. I've made, this is probably, like I said, this is probably my fourth or fifth one. Um, let's see. Let's see what this looks like lengthwise. I do have, with my coffee, I do have a tape measure here somewhere. So I want it to be shorter than 19 inches, but I also don't want to be able to add a rip. So this is about 15. This is 15 inches. So I think we'll stop here and add a rib. For the rib, I think we'll use a smaller hook. So we'll use the four millimeter. And we'll do the bottom here. 
I did 12, I chained 12 to do the ribs. So I think I will do the same at the sleeve. So we already have a chain of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Now I know that looks quite long for a rib, but when you do the rib, it sort of shrinks down as you stitch. So I'm going to do the rib in, because this is double crochet in a 5.5 millimeter, I will do the rib in a half double crochet because I don't want it to be too tight. A half double crochet with a four millimeter hook. So it'll, it should give me a similar gauge as this. So you see how I wanted the hem here to pull in a little bit, to cinch in a little bit, but not too much. I didn't want it to be like a blouse on type of top. So this is a half double crochet rib against double crochet row. So let's try that on the sleeve. Sometimes I do like the sleeve to be a bit tighter, but I don't want it to be uncomfortable, especially because this is for a child. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. We'll do 13. So we'll do the half double crochet into the back loops. I pulled that last one too tight. I really love crocheting ribs. I think it's so pretty and so gratifying when things are things come out neat and tidy. And I'm not like a neat freak. Like I've blurred the background of where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in front of a window, but this room is really messy right now. I think something about the pandemic and changing our living spaces from living spaces into workspaces. It's been especially challenging for me in terms of organization. And I still haven't come to terms with it. So now I need to see which way to go with this. We'll go this way. And we go this way. I always seem to seem to go the wrong way. Let's go, let's come up this way. So to do ribbon, just the first one you join at the base. And then, so I like to count every row, just casually count to make sure I'm not dropping any stitches. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, four. So we start there. I think there's yarn in my nose. Stuff like this happens when you crochet with fuzzy yarn. The only annoying thing about this yarn is that I can't start it from the middle because I've tried to start some of these skeins from the middle and pull from the middle, but it just gets all knotted up. So I've been unraveling it from the outside, which is a little bit less smooth of an experience, but it's fine. And then when it gets to like the last bit, it always just winds itself up into knots. I have to sort of manually wind it into a ball so I can use it at the very end. Rib one. So gratifying at the end when with a sweater or a cardigan or something, it really comes together. I think there's something about crocheting, especially crocheting a wearable. There's like an element in crochet where 
in the first like 30 percent of the project i feel like you you have a roadmap even if you're using a like you know especially if you're using a pattern or something but there's an element of having to trust the process a lot and that is something that I have had trouble doing in my life is trusting the process when it doesn't feel like it's coming together quickly enough. I'm a little bit impatient. What's rewarding about crochet is that 30% of the process in when something really starts to come together and take shape and like a sweater starts to look like a sweater, even though it's really difficult for like the first third of it, that feels really gratifying. And especially at the end when you have a finished product, it's incredibly gratifying. It feels very satisfying to me. I went to fashion school like 20 years ago. I did a master's in fashion and because I can't draw and I, I just don't have that artistic expression ability or talent, I did the journalism pathway in grad school. So I have an MA fashion and the pathway I did was journalism. Um, and we were all mixed in. We had, we had a lot of lecture, lectures together. I went to fashion school in London and I've always loved designers and like understanding their thought process and looking at sketches and things like that. There's something that I never understood. And this is so rudimentary what I'm doing. So basic. I'm like four months into crocheting and I've made like what, like a dozen sweaters, but making clothing, I think like literally making my first few sweaters and cardigans, I felt such a deep sense of satisfaction, like unlike anything that I've ever felt before. And I'm a, by trade, I'm a writer editor. I spent 20 years in media and I write and it, yes, yeah, it's gratifying to write something and complete it and see it in print. I've written a book, I used to write for newspapers for a long time. And then when digital started, that instant gratification of, typing something and hitting publish and then having your story go out on social media and like thousands of people read it and getting that feedback that sure that's gratifying but maybe it's because digital publishing has taken the I don't know the specialness out of it right not like not because it's popular and that anyone can be platformed now anyone can publish but it's just this, there's something very different about working on construction and planning and strategy for a long time and then having a finished product like a book or I don't know, a dissertation or something like that or a sweater or and like typing something up in 20, like 20 minutes and then hitting publish. There's something very different about that. And what I think one thing I became very disillusioned with in media is that Oftentimes, the thing that you spend the most time and effort and energy on and thing you care most about may not be the thing that once published reaches the most people. It's like the stories you care most about telling may not be the stories that the audience necessarily wants to consume just because of the way that, di that digital media is set up. You have to seek out the information oftentimes to be able to have the information delivered to you. Whereas before we would go to bookstores and there was there was a sense of browsing that doesn't really exist as much anymore in content consumption. So sometimes, oftentimes, it's like the story that took 10 minutes to type up, grab an image off Getty Images and publish will you know perform gangbusters <laughs> and something that you may have commissioned or you worked on or that you can you could have spent months or even years on, you know, researching and, you know, blood, sweat and tears on will reach, you know, a couple of hundred people. So I've become a little bit disillusioned with media over the years. And I spend a lot of time thinking about what's valuable in media now and what storytelling really is, how people engage with media, which is one of the reasons I'm so interested in YouTube and you know, I have never, I've never really done YouTube seriously. I've just dabbled in it. I used it to put like my travel videos on just so when I look back on somewhere, I can remember where I went and like what I did and see the people that I was with at the time, which is so fun. And there's something really different about video versus photographs. 
of course I love like Instagram and I keep all my photos and, you know, in a, in the cloud somewhere, but that's one of the reasons I think YouTube is so interesting as a platform and why I want to do it more is because YouTube is how most people who engage with content will have some kind of touch point with YouTube, except for parts of Asia where YouTube is not part of the digital ecosystem. For example, mainland China, where it's really, you, you need like a VPN to watch YouTube. And even then it's not easy. But for the most part, especially here in the US and in Western Europe, YouTube is the primary and probably the best run platform for publishers, whether independent or corporate or media or, you know, anybody, everyone's on YouTube, right? The biggest brands are on YouTube. The biggest publishers are on YouTube. The smallest creators, the biggest creators. It's such a fascinating platform. And it's the only platform that I, from my understanding, has a native monetization platform in AdSense. This is one of the biggest challenges with social media right? Like even Facebook, sure, Facebook ads are a thing, but it's really hard to monetize creator content, individual creator content on Facebook, unless you're cutting individual deals with either brands or you're part of the Facebook creator community. I, I don't know how face how creators are monetized on Facebook. And I think there's something that's not entirely transparent about it, or just, you know, at least not to outsiders and not as approachable to people who want to start. Instagram as well. I think most of my friends who are influencers on Instagram are cutting individual deals with brands and you need to be at a certain caliber to do that. There's so many scams on Instagram now too, or, or scam publicists or scam agencies. It's not great. It's really, it's really difficult to weed that out as a small creator and somebody who is not staffed. And I can't even imagine like the levels of media literacy you need to overcome if you're if you're just starting out on your own and you don't have your own community but i think what's great about youtube is that it's systematized the numbers are right there you look in your dashboard you can see all the data you can see all the cpms you can see the rpms you understand exactly where the money is coming from you understand how your channel is monetized it's it's really interesting this ecosystem that you that google has built on youtube and i think it's it's incredibly, it's so great. What an amazing tool. What an amazing platform. And of course, YouTube is such, I mean, it's, it's unbeatable as an educational platform. Sure, there's a lot of stuff on here that's like, can like, you know, verge on the scammy. But for example, I learned to crochet just by watching YouTube videos. And every time I have a question about something, like um, on this sweater, I do a reverse single crochet. And the first time I encountered reverse single, single crochet was in a pattern. And all it said was reverse single crochet. And I was like, what the heck is that? And it wasn't in any of the crochet books that I had. I don't, I don't have a lot of crochet books, but it wasn't in any of them. And without YouTube, I can't imagine. Like if if this was 25 years ago, right? Like when I was growing up, if I was like a teenager, or if, I was, if I was in my early 20s and I was trying to crochet something and I didn't know what a reverse single crochet was, how would I find that out? I would have to like find a crochet club and pick up a landline and call somebody or call a shop. And even like, I guess back then there were way more independent yarn shops and crochet and knitting shops. But now I think in Manhattan... There are not that many. I think there are four or five independent yarn shops in Manhattan, at least that I have found. There's one Michaels, one. There's no Joann's. There's no Walmart in New York City. There's not that many places to buy yarn. So I don't even know. I have, I have no idea. If this was 25 years ago, I have no idea where I would find out what a reverse single crochet was. But in YouTube... I found out in three seconds.
something I think is really interesting that's happening now on YouTube is that as of February 1st, YouTube is monetizing shorts and sharing that monetization with creators who are uploading shorts. So right before February 1st, there was this massive push to get people who are on YouTube to post more shorts. And I think a lot of people were posting things from TikTok or from Reels on Instagram to shorts on YouTube. And I did that a little bit with, I would do a lot of restaurant content because I live in New York City and I love restaurants and I love restaurant culture. I love trying new foods. And of course there are restaurants I go back to over and over again. I just love them. I love that feeling of going out to dinner with your friends. And also in New York, everyone's apartments are so small. Nobody goes to each other's houses. So restaurants are a real, it's, they're, so they're, they're a real lifeline in the city. But um, so I post a lot of restaurant TikToks and reels and I don't get anything for it from it, right? Like TikTok's creator fund is only for big creators on TikTok. Reels, I'm not. You know, and on Instagram, I have like 4,000 followers, so I'm not big enough to get brand deals. And, you know, you don't really get brand deals from restaurants anyway. Restaurant profit margins are so low. I post it because I love it. And for a long time, I was posting that restaurant content also on YouTube Shorts. And what I've decided to do is create yarn and crochet content for shorts exclusively and not post yarn and crochet shorts to TikTok or Reels because I don't get anything from those platforms. I'm. It's really hard to grow on Instagram in 2023. It's not like it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago where, you know, when if you hit Instagram and really threw effort behind it, in those early days, it was still possible to grow. But now Instagram is very ad driven. It's very, the algorithm, I, I mean, I can't figure it out. But at least if I post something on shorts, there's an opportunity to maybe make a couple of cents off of it. I don't really understand the YouTube shorts algorithm though. I have found that I could post nearly the same short one day after another title it nearly the same thing and one will be serviced to like 2,000 people and one will be serviced to 100 people. So I'm not 100% sure how this algorithm works yet, but it is fun to, it is fun to make vertical videos <laughs> and to post that content. Seriously, I love crocheting ribs like look how pretty that is already it's so satisfying and it's so neat and it's also stretchy there's something so satisfying about this to me and i love a rib for the sweaters i've been making for myself i've been doing really really long ribs at the hem i really enjoy it i don't know why <laughs> One of the reasons I picked up this particular yarn is because of the pastel colorway. And when the new, when the, well, not new anymore, but when the latest Karen cakes came out, probably about three or four weeks ago at this point, the ones that are the Blossom cakes, I think, they're an acrylic cotton mix. I ended up ordering a few extra from the Michaels website because my store, my local Michaels ran out. But I got them because I think they're really good spring colors, right? They're all pastel -y, they're all variegated and they're cotton, which is great for spring. And I, I've been mostly learning crochet using acrylic and polyester yarn because it's really, it's way more affordable by a mile. And since I'm still just learning, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to be working in expensive wool yarns. I did pick up some wool yarns in the UK when I was there in December. It was a lot more affordable buying it there because I was buying British wool in Britain. So I saved on export fees and taxes and things like that. So I did buy a few skeins over there 
and yarn yarn craft is way more popular there right like i there's you know in most department stores they have a haberdashery and they do have a pretty good selection of yarn a lot of good wools just available at your local department store which is not something that like macy's does not have yarn bloomingdale's does not have yarn bergdorf goodman does not have yarn but um so i picked up some nicer yarn in england and i have been using those on projects once i feel confident in techniques i'll use those for projects but mostly i have been learning on acrylic and what i am trying to do because even though it is so cold outside right now we're in early february in new york it's gonna be spring in like eight weeks so i better start thinking about warmer weather projects because i just started crocheting and i don't want to i know myself i don't want to lose interest and lose this practice that i've had and waste all this practice that i've had over the past few months once it gets warmer because like you know i don't want to feel like oh well there's no point in making anything because everything i'm making is wool or in a cozy acrylic and it's 90 degrees outside because it does get so hot in new york in the spring and summer sometimes so as we get closer to spring i think i will be doing more projects in cotton i'm going to try doing some linen some bamboo I did, I do watch Cinnamon Stitches. I'm like obsessed with her channel. She's so funny and she posts so many times every week. And I love in the morning when I'm having my coffee and she's already posted her video for the day. I'll sit there and I'll have my coffee and I'll watch her videos. But she did show a cotton bamboo yarn on her channel the other day. And I think I might want to get some and try it. She says it's really soft, which is the one thing with cotton that you know i feel like you can't tell until you touch it but i definitely trust her because she's the one who well like she's her channel is the channel that i learned about premier yarns from and i've ordered so many yarns from premier yarns and i've been very happy with it so i trust her judgment and recommendations the cotton bamboo yarn she recommended is called kobu c-o-b-o-o -O. So I haven't had a chance to look it up yet, but I want to look it up and I'm going to order some and see how it goes. I can't drive. Otherwise, I would drive to a Joann's or a Walmart or a Hobby Lobby or a larger Michael's even. Um, that's something I cannot do. I have I don't have a lot of practical skills, so maybe that's why I enjoy crocheting so much. It's like my one productive practical skill. There are no Joann's or Walmarts or Hobby Lobbies in Manhattan. I don't even think there's Joann's or another big craft store in the five boroughs. There's another, there are a couple of other Michaels, maybe more than a couple. I think there are a couple of in Queens that are harder to get to if you don't drive. There's two or three in Brooklyn. The closest one to me in Brooklyn is the one at Atlantic Avenue and I did go there one time when I I wanted some emergency yarn for a project that I wanted to finish immediately and they had it in stock so I took an Uber there which was fine it's so close but there are a couple of things I really want to do I like wish existed because I just started crocheting I missed out on the whole crochet cruise program that I think what is a crochet club they used to run crochet cruises I would love to go on a crochet cruise. <laughs> like my dream is to take a round the world cruise with like a really nice balcony cabin and just go away for like a hundred days, take two giant suitcases of yarn with me and just sit on the balcony and crochet and then take breaks and go to the buffet and go to shows. Like that to me sounds like heaven right now be so nice just to get out of New York and get some fresh air and make a lot of things. I think Club Crochet, Crochet Club used to run crochet cruises and I watched a few of their YouTube videos from the cruises and it looks so fun. I would love to do that. And I would, I also wish, this is like a, this is strange because most people my age can drive, but I wish somebody would run like a big craft store van 
or like a tour bus. Like I would totally go on a Saturday morning, get on like a big bus in midtown Manhattan and go to a bunch of suburban superstores. It doesn't have to be limited to craft stores. Like we could also go to Walmart and to a Costco. I just don't know how people would handle getting all this stuff home, but they used to run a free Ikea bus. Or I think they still do a free Ikea bus from Port Authority in New York City. And when I was younger and I was furnishing my first apartment, I would take the Ikea bus and just haul things home, like make a friend come with me and haul shelves back to Manhattan and get in a cab at Port Authority and bring it home. But I wish someone would do that for a craft store, for people like me who can't drive, or people who don't have cars and don't want to rent cars. I don't know. I had this feeling, I had this like very strong compulsion a couple of weekends ago. I was like, I really want to go to Secaucus in New Jersey, which I think is the closest Walmart superstore. And I've heard that, you know, Walmart has a lot of yarn and it's very affordable. And I just want to go check it out. And sometimes I just want to get out of the city, but it's also next to a giant suburban Michaels. I'm like dying to go to like a giant suburban craft store. So I was like, I wonder what if I take an Uber there? Could I walk between the Walmart and the Michaels? Absolutely not. Like I would get run over. There's like a highway in between. And then I was like, well, there's something called drive as directed with Uber where you just hire an Uber for a set number of hours and you just like, just go wherever. So expensive. So definitely not worth it. I mean, how ridiculous to take like a $200 Uber ride to Walmart to buy $3 yarn. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Maybe I should just get a driver's license. Maybe this year will be the year. Maybe this year will be the year. It's so expensive to learn how to drive in New York City. It's part of the reason. But also, I can't commit. I can't commit to, like, three months of lessons. I've literally never sat in the driver's seat and turned on the ignition in a car my whole life. So it's really starting from zero. I also know that if I had a driver's license, I would, like, always be on the road. I would be on a constant road trip. One of my friends has um, driven, like in one year, he drove across country 13 times. And I'm like, oh, I would totally do that. Okay, so look, so I finished a cuff. Looks cute. Like maybe, or maybe we do one more row. Let's do one more. One more. Just do. Or maybe this is okay, actually. Okay. So, to bind the ends of the cuff together, I sort of, I do a slip stitch, but also inspired by a mattress stitch. So, I just do it on the inside. So, it looks pretty when you're finished. I just do it on the inside loops. So, the back loop of the row closest, closest to me and the front loop of the row farther from me. And you get a kind of a pretty finish because with mattress stitch sewing things together, at least that's what I think it's called, mattress stitch, it looks really pretty. But this way, you don't have to get on a needle. I really don't have anything against sewing, but it's just it's an extra step and it's an extra knot. It's an extra joint where things can fall apart. I had so many sweaters that I had worked on early on when I first started making sweaters where I would finish them and I'd be so pleased with it. And then I didn't know at the time how to join like granny squares, how to make knots. And I'm still learning all that stuff. But so many of them, I would finish them, pick them up. They would look so cute and they would instantly just fall apart, like literally just fall apart. So, okay, so this one we can fasten off. Look, it looks really nice. The mattress stitch gives a really clean seam finish. I made a video about the <laughs> featuring these scissors ones. These are the best things that I have in my crochet kit. No, I mean, besides all the crochet stuff, but this is the best accessory. It's a slip and snip pair of scissors, and they're TSA approved, which is 
one of my favorite things about them. So you can take them onto a plane easily. No one's going to stop you. They're not sharp enough to really hurt anybody, but they're sharp enough to cut yarn. What I also like about them is that they're made in the USA. I bought them years and years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago at a shop in New York City that used to source all of these local items from around the world. That doesn't make any sense. Local items from around the world. But they would find things that regions would specialize in. And these, I think, are from like North Carolina or something. I'm not totally sure. They're great had them for years and have never had any issue with sharpening them or anything so i'm gonna pull that through i'm not gonna weave that in until i'm done with everything else but that's a cuff it's a sleeve and a cuff maybe i should have gone the other way it's hard to do though the variegated yarn you're never really sure if what you're seeing is part of the variegation is that a word variegation or because of the way that I've gone. Okay, um, I'm going to start on the other sleeve now. I can't believe I've spent 45 minutes just doing a cough. <laughs> but thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. And I will probably post a short once I finish this cardigan. So far, so good. The light is also fading. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time.